Psalm 23 in your Bibles, if you have it. And uh, we're going to look and kind of go here verse by verse as we uh, normally would in uh, 1 Peter. And we're going to do that here in Psalm 23. And I hope and pray that the Lord would encourage and work this morning. Psalm 23 is undoubtedly one of the most well-known passages in Scripture. Charles Spurgeon once referred to Psalm 23 as the pearl of the Psalms. We won't get into this for time's sake, but it's interesting that the position of the psalm, I think is it's worthy of notice. It follows Psalm, obviously, 22, which if you study the Bible, you know that Psalm 22 is known as the Psalm of the Cross. It's almost as a messianic prophecy of the words of Christ as he hung on Calvary. And it's interesting, you could read Psalm 22 on your own, but we get the idea through Scripture that there are no green pastures of Psalm 23. There are no still waters on the other side of the 22nd Psalm. It's only after we read, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, that we come to the Lord as my shepherd. And again, this is not the message, but I think it's important to just to point out. We must, by experience, know the value of, of the bloodshedding of Christ and see the sword awakened against the shepherd before we shall be able to truly know the sweetness of the good shepherd's care. Now Psalm 23, as I mentioned earlier, has been used millions of times at memorial service and funeral services to comfort those grieving the loss of a loved one. And this week, although I again have memorized Psalm 23, most of you probably have and can recite it, I picked up a book on Monday and uh, started reading it, that went through Psalm 23 and kind of went back and did some of my own studying on it and praying on it, and the Lord really just brought it to life for me, and that's why I feel is where God would have us this morning. And so I want to do it justice, and I want the Lord to work and speak through me this morning. Psalm 23 is written by King David, who we know Scripture says is a man after God's own heart. Before he was a king, you can study the life of David, probably my, one of my most favorite characters in the Bible, but he was known as a lowly, he was a lowly shepherd. He was the youngest in his family. The psalmist here, as he pens these words, he was not unacquainted with the office of being a shepherd, with the duties of a shepherd. He had fed his father's sheep in the mountains of Bethlehem. And the Bible tells us that he even fought off a bear and a lion for the sake and the well-being of his sheep. And so David understood the parallel that he's making here through Scripture between the task of a shepherd caring for his sheep and a God caring for his people. So we know it's written by David. And it's written either in a time different people have different opinions and ideas of when David wrote this psalm. Some think it was when he was distressed, he was running, he was being persecuted by his father-in-law Saul and he was in the forest hiding. And you can read that story in 1 Samuel 22. And so he writes these words to comfort himself in the fact that the Lord is a shepherd. Others believe that it was a time of prosperity in his reign as king. That he was rejoicing and worshiping the Lord and wrote these words. Either way, we don't know when he wrote it. But we know that the Holy Spirit of God work through him and inspired him to write it and preserve the words for you and I today. Let's look at verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, if we're not careful, we just blow right through that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall now pause and think about what David's writing. The Lord is my shepherd. You almost get a sense of feeling of pride that David's saying, the Lord is my shepherd. Just as a young boy who might say to his friend at school, well, my dad's stronger than your dad. Well, my dad does this occupation. Almost a sense of pride as the Lord is my shepherd. But when I read that, I ask myself, he says, the Lord, who exactly is the Lord? Now I ask that hypothetically to think in your own mind and heart, and we're going to answer it through Scripture, but the Lord is my shepherd. Who is the Lord? If we pause for a moment to reflect on the person of Christ, 
on his power and his achievements, then like David, I believe we'll come to a point where we can state proudly, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord, the Godhead, the three in one, the Trinity. God, the Father. God is the author, the originator of all that exists, Scripture says. God the Son, our Savior, the Creator, the one who died on the cross for you and I. God the Holy Spirit is God who, who the agent who presents these facts to my mind and my spirit and your mind and your spirit so that we can understand and be, they be, can become both real and relative to me as an individual. That is the Lord who David is speaking about. The Lord is, and notice he says, my shepherd. Now, I wouldn't be wrong to say the Lord is everyone's shepherd, all believers' shepherd, but it's personal to David. He is my shepherd. I am his sheep. I belong to him. One commentator says it links a lump of common clay to divine destiny. A mere mortal becomes the cherished object of divine diligence. This is not just something we say off the cuff or that we say flippantly when we truly understand what we're saying, that God is deeply concerned about you and I this morning. That there is a God who cares about you and knows you and loves you and is compassionate towards you. Now, I'm not a science buff by any means. In fact, it was my science and math and my worst subjects in school. History and English, I'm there. Math and science, no thank you. But you study science, and you know there are, scientists roughly say, 100 billion stars that exist. Think about that number. All those stars we know as believers created by God. Earth, among all of that, is just a speck of matter in space. And scientists say if it were possible to transport our most powerful telescope to our nearest neighboring star, and from that star look all the way back, the earth would not be seen, even with our most powerful instrument. Now that to me, when I dwell and think on it, is a humbling thought that should, when you think about it, drain our ego. That the very God who created all of this the creator of something so magnificent, of such beauty and power, unthinkable magnitude. He calls me his sheep and invites me and you to be his, or him to be our shepherd. It's no accident that God shows us to call us his sheep. Now you study, and again, it might be not a subject you want to go study and learn about, but it's interesting when you read scripture here, you study that of a sheep. And you'll see that the behavior of human beings and sheep is very similar. They have mob instincts. We're going to do what everybody's doing. Fearful. I know about you, but it's me. Timid. Stubborn. My wife could attest to that. Not very smart. <laughs> A lot of stupidity there. Me. <laughs> Perverse in their habits. All parallels of a sheep. Yet despite that, God loved us and died for us and saved us and calls us by name and makes us his own and cares for our every need. The Lord is my shepherd, David says. And then notice what he says. He says, I shall not want. Now that word want there has really two meanings when you study the context. The main concept, I shall not want, is that of not lacking in proper care or management. But the second emphasis is the idea of being utterly contented in the good shepherd's care. And notice this, and consequently not craving or desiring anything more. Christ who is my life. He is all that I need. His care and his management in my life is all that I need. Christ is sufficient for you and I. In Christ as his sheep, I find contentment. I find joy. I find peace. I find fulfillment. You can picture two types of sheep, two flocks of sheep, and there's one where they're not really cared for. There's one where their shepherd's really not on his A game. Maybe their water is polluted. Their shepherd spends no time with them and neglects them. There's wild animals that prey on them. 
There's disaster and pain and confusion. And you draw the parallel that that is what it's like to live in this world full of sin and full of Satan and full of the flesh. But those who have found Christ have entered his flock and sought his face and truly knows what it means when David says, I shall not want. When you really get a taste of who God is, when you really put your faith in God and spend time with Him, when you really seek His face, you'll start to realize seeking the next dollar bill is not as important. The joys of this world, not that important. The Bible says you cannot serve two masters. Too many Christians today, we have one foot in the Bible and one foot in church and one foot in the world and our own lusts and self and desires. But when a Christian gets all in for God and makes God his shepherd, Christ his shepherd, and seeks him and knows him on a personal basis, you will stand to say what David says, I shall not want. What does the hymn say? The the things of this world, they grow strangely dim. When my eyes are on my Savior, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Notice verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Now, you study it, and this is what I was studying and reading this week, and I think it's so interesting. The strange thing about sheep is that because of their very makeup, it's almost impossible for them to lie down. Unless four requirements are met. And the shepherds say these are those four requirements. One, they're free from friction with others of their kind. Two, they're free from torment by flies or parasites or different insects and bugs. Three, they're free from fear. As timid creatures, there's no fear in them. And four, they're fear from hunger. If they're hungry, they will not lie down. So to be at rest, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. For a sheep to find rest, there must be a definite sense of freedom from fear and tension and aggravation and hunger. And only one person can free the sheep from those four anxieties. And that's their shepherd. The owner plays, the shepherd plays such an important part in the sheep's management. And it is the shepherd who makes it possible for the sheep to lie down, to rest, to relax, to be content, to be quiet. He makes me to lie down, David says. He's speaking to the keen awareness that as a sheep in the flock of God, we know that our shepherd is nearby. Life, we can be honest this morning, is full of hazards and unknowns and dangers and disasters he said fear of parasites or insects for sheep well we draw the parallel in our own life unknowns dangers fears all these things the unknown makes us like a sheep we want to run off and scatter isn't that our initial reaction when we face something we just want to bolt and get out but yet when we pause and realize Christ is our shepherd, we understand that he is nearby, he is with us, he is there. And because of the fact that Christ, the good shepherd, is looking after me, it makes all the difference. Because of the closeness of my Savior, I have hope, I have rest, I can breathe. Even when things seem out of control and tense and fear fills my mind and heart, I understand that I am a Christian and that my master is Christ and that he is near and he's in complete control. 2 Timothy 1.7, my life verse. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And a Christian who is close to his Savior understands that Christ is the shepherd and he is the sheep doesn't have to be fearful of the unknowns and the hazards of this life. Why? Because the shepherd's there. Flies and parasites, what other thing that causes rest for them? They have friction with others of their kind. Contention and jealousy keep sheep from lying down. Wanting to be in charge or lead the sheep to assert themselves. But the presence of the shepherd is what causes them to find contentment in who they are and what God has called them to do. 
Godliness with contentment is great gain, 1 Timothy says. And that's why as a church, it is not just uh, something I do that's just cute or good to say, but I stand up here every Sunday and I say, I want Christ to be the center of everything that we do. Why? Because this is not about Zach Kinsman. This is not about the Kinsman family or the Capello family or anybody else. This is about Christ. He is the shepherd. He is the one who deserves all the glory and honor. And if God's going to use our church, he needs to be the center of everything that we do. Because when as sheep we start to assert ourselves and our opinions and our authority, it causes friction. And we can't lie down. Parasites, insects, friction with one another, fear of hunger. Can we be honest? People in this world, they're looking for answers. Their souls will only be satisfied and spiritually fed from the great shepherd. I believe the last few years I was talking to a pastor this week. And he said, we just have people coming to church just, just randomly that we haven't even talked to. They're just coming through the doors and more than we've seen in recent years. And I believe that's a testament because people are looking for something. They're hungry for something. Their soul and their heart desire something. And we know the only one that can fulfill that spiritual desire and that void in their life is Jesus Christ, the great shepherd. Verse 3, he says, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now again, going on this parallel of a shepherd to sheep, you study sheep. And you'll come across a certain kind of sheep that can be found occasionally in a flock. The shepherds call them the cast sheep. Or we would say the cast down sheep. It's an old English term for a sheep that is turned over on its back and cannot get up again by itself. You can watch YouTube videos on it or look it up, but it's a very pathetic sight. There's a sheep and they're lying on its back. Their feet are in the air. They're struggling to stand up. They're in a pure frantic mode. Sometimes it will bleed out for help, but usually it just lies there in frightened frustration. And if not found, their blood will start to stop to circulate, and eventually they will either die by a predator or they will die just by suffocation and lack of oxygen and being there too long. And that is why a good shepherd is always watching and keeping count of his sheep. And if one is missing, the shepherd will say, my first thought is, one of my sheep must be cast somewhere. Because not only is a good shepherd that's looking for cast sheep, don't miss this, not only is a good shepherd looking for a sheep that's on its back that is cast down, but also predators are looking for easy targets. Because they know if they found a sheep that's there and there's vulnerable and that's lying on its back, they can pounce and it's an easy target. And we draw the parallel in our spiritual life. How many times, yes, we can be believers and we can put our faith in Christ and we can know heaven's our home, but we find ourselves like a sheep that's cast down. Life's anxieties and struggles are just too much. Fear fills our mind. Depression fills our mind. Grief fills our mind. We're tormented. We're overwhelmed. And many times we just find ourselves flat on our back and that's exactly where the enemy wants us because that's where he can get into our heart and mind and say, God doesn't love you. God's not working in your life. That religion thing might be good for them, but it's not good for you. But a good shepherd's looking for sheep that are cast down. Now, a sheep that's cast down, they get this way. There's many reasons. I'll just give you a few. They get this way first is because they grow comfortable. They find a good spot in the meadow. And they're comfortable. They're doing good. And eventually, they're so comfortable, they just roll over. What's the parallel here for us? Never, never, never arrive in your faith. Never think you got it all figured out. Never think you know everything about God's word. Never think you're an expert. Always be hungry to know more. Always have a desire to be close to the shepherd. Always have a desire to learn more and grow in your faith because when you come to that point of being comfortable, you roll over, you backslide, and you find yourself cast down. They find themselves cast down when they're comfortable, but also when they're overweight. They roll over and they can't get up. What's the parallel I draw from that? Never arrive or never find fulfillment in your success or your earthly riches. Die to yourself. Trust and seek the great shepherd. Don't get fat on the things of this world. 
Don't let your main appetite be on what the world says and earthly desires and monetary goals. And some of those things are not bad. But when they're your main desire and they're what you feed your soul and your spirit with on a daily basis, more than God and the good shepherd, you'll start to grow fat in the things of this world. And you find yourself easy target to be cast down. Nonetheless, the truth remains that when we find ourselves cast down or depressed or hurting or struggling, we don't serve a God. Get this out of your mind this morning. We don't serve a God who's fed up. Again? You got to be kidding me. This is three times this week. This is a hundred times this month. I'm done with this sheep. Let him be cast down. Let him have what he wants. No, we serve when we study scripture a shepherd, a compassionate shepherd who comes out like a good shepherd would. You know what he does when we're cast down? He gently stands us up. As David said, he restores our soul. He keeps us moving forward with him. And then, what does he say? He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. A good shepherd leads his sheep every step of the way to the sheep that obey him and trust him and have complete understanding and faith that he's in control. I'm going to read you a quote. It's just, just really ministered to me this week, and I want you to grasp this. One preacher of old said, Human beings, being what they are, somehow feel entitled to question the reasons for everything that happens to them. In many instances, life itself becomes a continuous criticism and dissection of one's circumstances and acquaintances. We look for someone or something on which to blame for our misfortune. We are often quick to forget our blessings and slow to forget our misfortunes. But if one really believes his affairs are in God's hands, every event no matter whether it's joyous or tragic, will be taken as a part of God's plan. To know beyond a doubt that he does all for our welfare is to be led into a wide area of peace and quietness and strength for every situation. Can I say to you this morning, stop trying to figure it all out and trust the Lord. Follow and obey and trust the good shepherd. He is in control. It is not our job to draw out the map and come up with the instructions. It's our job as sheep to listen to the voice of the good shepherd and know that he knows the way. Know that he'll lead us around the paths of righteousness, that he'll restore our soul and trust him. Well, Pastor Zach, this happened to me and it hurts and I don't know why it happened and maybe it's because of this reason or because it's that reason. Don't let your mind and heart go down that rabbit hole, but instead decide as a believer who sold out to God, I will trust the good shepherd. He's in control. He makes all things for good if I trust him and love him and follow him. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We reach the halfway point of Psalm 23. And if you notice, if we're paying attention, we find a switch in David's address. The first half of the psalm is as though David's rejoicing and proclaiming to those lost sheep in the world that he has a great shepherd. But now he turns his direction and his words directly to the shepherd, to the Lord. For thou art with me. I will fear no evil. Personal pronouns. Now you study this. And again, I know I'm drawing a lot of parallel between a real life shepherd and sheep and what David is writing here who was a shepherd. But you study this and this just really blew my mind as I did this week. Shepherds will take a yearly journey with their sheep to the high, lush mountain pastures, usually in the summer. Although the pastures on the mountains are amazing and fulfilling and safe havens for the sheep, they are not just, sheep are not just flown by plane to the top of these mountains. In order to get to these mountains where the shepherd's leading them, they are led by the shepherd through the valleys below in order to reach the pastures of the mountaintops. The shepherd, if he's a good shepherd, he knows in the valley that they're full of poisonous plants, they're full of wild animals. They're full of rock slides, all kinds of danger that could hurt the sheep and the flock. But a good shepherd 
was familiar with the terrain of the valleys and they've been there before and experienced it. So they know the best ways to take the sheep through the valley and the best path to take to reach the mountain. And as we draw the parallel this morning, can we answer this question? Can we be honest with ourselves? Maybe you've been there, maybe you're there right now, but have you ever felt in your life that I was in the valley of the shadow of death? You say, well, pastor, that's a little dramatic. But you put yourself there and you think in your mind and your heart, grief beyond comprehension, an unexpected medical diagnosis that you didn't think was going to happen, a strained relationship that you're trying to make better, but nothing seems to be working, loneliness, rejection, fear. Can we be honest this morning? It is dark, it is real, it is painful. In my own life, I can share stories with you this morning, and I'm not going to bore you or throw a pity party because we can all share things in our life where we felt that time in our life. We went through it, and God, I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death. It's dark. It's weary. It's depressing. It's heavy. It hurts. I know I'm supposed to read my Bible. I know I'm supposed to pray. I know what I'm supposed to do, but God, I can't bring myself to do it. It feels like darkness surrounds me. It feels like when I wake up in the morning, it's a heaviness on my heart and mind. It feels like when I go to bed at night, there's anxiety and nerves that just fill my heart and mind. It's, it's real and it's raw and I face it and I fight it and it's dark. The valley of the shadow of death. And I know many of you here this morning, and you're carrying those burdens. You're carrying those hurts. And as your pastor and as your friend, trust me, I want nothing more than just to solve all of your problems and your hurts. I would like nothing more than just to take what you're going through and just to take it off your back. To call an Uber driver to come in the valley and pick you up and get you out. To do whatever I could to remove those burdens. But as I study this psalm and I understand the Christian life, I recognize a few things in my own valleys and in your valleys. Number one, I recognize that Christ, our shepherd, has been through the valley before. Hebrews 4.12 says, For we have a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. A good shepherd knows when he's leading his sheep through the valley, hey, don't eat that plant. Hey, stay away from here. There's a pack of coyotes in that cave, so we're going to go this way. They know the way to take. Why? Because they've been through it before. And praise the Lord, we serve a risen Savior who has defeated sin, who's defeated death, who's overcome this world. He's already been through it, so surely he can take us through it if we trust him. Christ, our shepherd, has been through the valleys before. Keep my eyes locked on him and follow him. But notice David says, though I walk, what? Through the valley. He doesn't say, I'll lie down and die in the valley. It's over. Sometimes we feel that way. He doesn't say, I'll be airlifted out of the valley. He doesn't say, I will stop in the valley. It's my ultimate destination. No, he says, I will what? Walk through the valley. We gain higher ground in our Christian life. We increase our faith in the Christian life. We become more like Christ and closer to him by climbing up to the mountains through the valley. And as I was reading and studying this, shepherds say with their sheep that although the mountains are amazing, we all want to get there in our faith. We all want to be on the mountaintops. But sometimes a shepherd will say the most refreshing streams that the sheep can drink from are found in the valleys on the side of the mountains. Though the valleys are tough, and though there are rocks and dangers and poisonous plants and predators and all of the things and the darkness and heaviness of it, there are some moments, there are some places in the valley where a shepherd can lead his sheep to a stream that is more refreshing than something they'll find on the mountaintop. And I don't know what it is, but if we quit blaming God and turning from him when we face the valleys, 
but rather turn to him and say, God, I don't get this. I don't know why I'm going through this, but I trust you. Often is that is when God becomes real in your life. You know when you have the sweetest times of communion and fellowship with God? When you drink from those streams that are just so refreshing. The mountaintop's good, and don't get me wrong, I want to be there. Our church is what? New heights. I want to reach new heights. I want to get to the mountaintop. But it's in the valley sometimes that God brings us through where we have the most refreshing drink, meaning what? The most real communion with God. When our heart is hurting, when our heart is heavy, when our world is shaken, when we wake up one morning to a news that just changes everything and we know we'll never be the same, when our heart is shattered, when our heart is broken, when we feel lonely and rejected and depressed and anxious and stressed and all of the above. For the Christian that stops, says, God, I don't know why I'm going through this. I don't know why I'm facing this. I don't know why it feels like I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, but I trust you. And it's in those times, and I can attest in my Christian life, the times where I have grown leaps and bounds in my faith was not when everything was going good, but when it was hard. When I didn't want to wake up the next morning, when I didn't want to deal with my problems, but I decided I'm going to go to the Good Shepherd and let God speak to me, and there's a realness and there is a closeness that is there. Real Christianity is going through the valleys with the shepherd. And as we go through the valleys, what does David say? We don't have to fear evil. Why? Because thou art with me. We serve the ultimate good shepherd who is right there with us. John 10, 11, Jesus speaking, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But I want to draw your attention real quickly, and we're just about done, to the end of verse 4. Notice what he says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What comforts us in the valley? What gets us through the valley? Yes, the shepherd, but the shepherd has tools in our lives to help us get through the valley. We can do a whole Bible study on what is the rod and the staff. But I'm going to give you quickly, in a nutshell, the staff is a symbol of the concern and compassion a shepherd has for the flock. It's used with the comfort of the sheep in, their, in mind. The rod is a concept of authority, power, discipline, defense against danger, long-suffering, kind. And so we draw the parallel of the rod in the Christian's life is what? The Word of God. The rod is that authority and power and defense against danger in our life. And what is the staff? It's the Spirit of God in our lives. You're going through the valley this morning. You're going through a struggle this morning. You're going through a dark time this morning. You want to give in to temptation. You want to give in to pride. You want to give in to lust. You want to give in to self. You want to call it quits. You don't know how you can see it through. Remember, you have a good shepherd who's already went through the valley. He'll take you through it. Listen and follow and obey him and take use and make use of the tools that he has, the rod and the staff, the word of God. Get in your Bible. Know your Bible. Become a student of your Bible. Meditate on your Bible. Memorize your Bible. And the Spirit of God that indwells you if you're a believer of Christ. Yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Die to self and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you every step of the way. Verse 5, and we'll go through these quickly. We're running out of time. Now prepare us a table before me. In the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The providence of God lays and spreads a table for his people in the wilderness and sets them down at it and bids us all to come and welcomes us to it. And though as Christians we'll face ridicule, though the world may hate us, though people may judge us, though people may talk about us, though trying circumstances may be upon you, in the presence of all that, there's a God who's not nervous. There's a God who's not shaking because someone talked about you. There's a God who's not nervous because they blasphemed his name. His heart's broken, but he's not scared. He's not worried. There's no rush. There's a God who's in control, and what's he doing? 
He's preparing a table for his sheep that follow him and hear his voice. In the presence of mine enemies, thou preparest a table, thou take care of his sheep. Verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we end how we started. What a thought that a holy, perfect, magnificent creator God would become a man, would face all the evil and ridicule this sorry, sick world can offer, would die a brutal, bloody death in order to save me, a stupid, selfish, wandering sheep. And not only save me, but welcome me into his flock so that what truly goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Not because I'm anything great. Not because I can go out and be, be a rich or wealthy or successful person. Not because any talents I have, but because I serve a good shepherd who died for me and loves me and cares for me. And goodness and mercy will follow me because of my shepherd. What a God. What a Savior. The Good Shepherd is ready to take control of your life. What can we do as sheep? We have to figure out the map through the valley? No, he's already figured that out. We have to learn how to succeed or find success among all the enemies and the craziness of this world? No, God's got that all figured out. What do we have to do? Stop holding on to sin. Stop holding on to pleasures and lusts and hurts and grief and bitterness and resentment and grudges that could date back to all the, all the way back to where you were a little child. Ask God to give you the victory. Let go of it. Let God lead and obey and follow the voice of God, your shepherd. And you'll be amazed that in times when it feels like you're going through the valley, in times of heartache, in times of maybe where, where you just are confused and you don't know what the next state is, you don't, you, there's a fear of the unknown. When you trust the Lord and you put your faith in Him and you get to know God for who He truly is and understand He's your shepherd, you're His sheep, there's a peace and a contentment there because God's in control. Stop fighting. Stop wandering. Stop calculating. Stop trying to figure it all out. And submit and surrender to the shepherd who loves you and cares and is in control.